is my pleasure then to welcome the, the president and CEO of, Kresge, of the Kresge Foundation, Rip Rapson, to the, to the podium. Um, and uh, Rip, I will be much, much more generous than Jenny, who only gave us, <laughs> she only gave us a measly 10 minutes. You got a full 15 minutes. Ladies and gentlemen, let's uh, welcome uh, President Rapson with a warm round of applause. Well, thank you so much. Um, this is a really uh, hazardous position to be in. You have been here for uh, eight and a half hours <laughs> with all sorts of information that is robust and provocative. Um, I have no slides to keep you entertained, I apologize. Um, although I could use the professor's last slide again, I suppose. Um, um, and most importantly, I stand between you and cocktails, so forgive me. I will, I will try to be brief. But I, I really do want to thank you uh, for welcoming me and the Kresge Foundation over these last couple of days. I've been visiting South Africa for uh, some 13 years. And with each visit, I have the honor and privilege of watching this great country evolve what it means to be a young democracy, with all of its successes and hardships and with all of its steps backward and its steps forward. Let me extend our particular appreciation to Sadie and the Sia Pumalala National Advisory Committee, who continually champion efforts to improve student success in higher education throughout this country. It's deeply gratifying to see those efforts lifted up, celebrated, and strengthened at this conference. The last two days of programming have underscored powerfully that your leadership is making a profound difference in the life of this nation's young people and the institutions that serve them. We're particularly grateful to Karen Stout of Achieving the Dream and Michael Sorrell of Paul Quinn College for traveling here to share their insights. I'm sorry I missed their presentations, but Bill tells me they were just really spectacular. We're proud to call these amazing innovators Kresge grantees. Our commitment to South Africa spans nearly 15 years. Throughout that entire period, it has been led with vision, intelligence, and compassion by Bill Moses. You've heard from Bill at yesterday's opening plenary. His ever stronger commitment to the cause of post-secondary success in both the United States and South Africa has made Kresge an infinitely more thoughtful and effective organization. Thank you, Bill. You've been just remarkable. And I know that Bill, knowing Bill, has told you everything you ever wanted to know about the Kresge Foundation, but uh, let me just embellish slightly, and if I become repetitive, please forgive me. Kresge is driven by the mission to build and strengthen pathways to opportunity for low-income people in American cities. The one and only exception to that focus is, of course, South Africa. That exception traces from an overarching belief on our part that our engagement in South Africa is a portal through which Kresge can enter and attach in some small but meaningful way to the international order. But the exception is also directly tied to three more specific commonalities between our two countries. First, South Africa's enduring commitment to stewarding a more democratic order continues to inspire the people of the United States and indeed the people of all nations. This year marks the 25th anniversary of South Africa's first democratic election. All of you who fought for democracy in your lifetimes, and there are many in the audience who did exactly that, know that a healthy democracy is an episodically difficult, sometimes elusive, and always fragile thing. And yet, you have endured on the path. You have interrogated your history in profound and authentic ways to recommit continuously to creating a more perfect union. Now, your past several years has been, have been filled to the brim with setbacks and I would suggest even some danger. But you have conducted another successful free and fair election and delivered a democratically elected president with reformist, forward-thinking ambitions. It is impossible to overstate our hope, not just at Kresge, but throughout American society, that South Africa continues to succeed. We like to think that we in the United States can also inspire others. A 250-year history of stable and occasionally, even if not currently perhaps, enlightened self-governance is a momentous accomplishment. 
But as all of you know, that sense of inspiration is proving harder and harder to cling to as our nation has become increasingly paralyzed by partisan divides, as we seem to be guided less by principle than by power and ego, and as we have replaced a president of transcendent decency and intelligence with Uh, well, let me simply say, with something less than that, we have a great deal to learn from your recent experiences. So like South Africa, the United States has its warts and its ulcers. But like South Africa, the United States remain committed to overcoming our deepest, most intractable challenges in democratic governance, in economic fairness, in racial justice. The second commonality between the two countries stems from the will and the skill your nation has exhibited in confronting directly the legacies of a brutal white supremacy. This experience is at once completely different from that of the United States, and yet disturbingly similar. The oppression of slavery and colonialism in both countries, a civil war and Jim Crow segregation in the United States, and apartheid and the ensuing struggles in South Africa. We are two of the most racially diverse nations on earth, with each of us struggling prof with profoundly deep, difficult inequities. South Africa has been characterized as the world's most unequal nation, but the United States is the most unequal nation in the OECD. It is a source of our deep and painful self-examination and self-criticism in the United States that, Despite our enormous wealth and despite the political affirmations of the continuing power of the American dream, our poorest citizens are mired in stagnant, debasing poverty, which hardens from generation to generation. There is a growing recognition in our country that although we have systematically sought to dismantle the most egregious, legally sanctioned manifestations of racism, we continue to be afflicted with deep and pervasive unconscious biases toward and structural obstacles to full racial equity and opportunity. As a result, people of color in the United States lag in every indicator of health and stability, in the accumulation of wealth, in job advancement, in home ownership, in business formations, in educational attainment, and on and on. So too in South Africa. We accordingly share the challenge of coming to grips with these legacies in a way that neither denies their invidiousness nor constructs impenetrable barriers to progress. The third commonality is that both nations are struggling to find an equitable path into the next generation of racially informed growth and economic opportunity. You went through reconciliation. We have not. We have introduced extensive and innovative city-based assaults on poverty your cities and townships are very early in your search for the most effective strategies to that end. We are just beginning to come to grips with the innumerable ways that globalization and technology are transforming the nature of work. You are at the front end of excavating the potential of a technological third wave. Our similarities are powerful, and we stand to learn a great deal from each other about policies, behaviors, and investment patterns of problems. But let me quickly turn to Kresge's continuing commitment to the universities of South Africa. Now, there's obviously no shortage of ways in which an American foundation might try to be helpful to this country. Kresge's focus on student success is a recognition of the transcendent importance of overcoming that challenge. In a country whose student population has doubled since the abolition of apartheid in 1994 and has become increasingly representative of the nation. Simply stated, the success of South Africa's democratic experience is inextricably interwoven with the success of next generation South African higher education. South African universities will be a critical driver in stabilizing your democracy, growing a future cadre of knowledge workers, evolving your national research, entrepreneurship, and innovation muscle, building and maintaining a middle class, modernizing your infrastructure, and ensuring balanced long-term economic growth. You know, it's hard to account year by year progress, but through the eyes of this outside visitor, the advancement of your higher education system over the arc of 13 years is just nothing short of breathtaking. Let me just say a word about that. 
Our grant making in your country began as a partnership with Inyatello, which helped eight universities and one teaching hospital double, triple, and even in some cases quadruple private fundraising between 2006 and 2018. This philanthropic giving has helped many South African universities fund new research initiatives, build essential facilities, and provide financial aid to students in need. But several years ago, our trustee Phil Clay and I met with the nation's vice chancellors and asked whether our support might go beyond support for fundraising. They replied in unison that Kresge should turn its sights to access and success. We took their wise counsel. The vice chancellor's advice resonated for the reasons I previously noted, the centrality of student success to the nation's future. And it was also an issue on which our American-based higher education work focused. As in South Africa, the United States' delivery on the promise of higher education continues to fall short. President Obama gave powerful voice to the belief that our nation's 21st century competitiveness would hinge on improving student outcomes and graduating more low-income and historically disadvantaged students. But the sad reality is that we have not, as a nation politic, summoned the will to do what it will take to do that. It's not entirely clear why. The economic benefits of higher education are crystal clear. Americans with an associate's degree can earn more than 250,000 more over their lifetimes than people with only a high school diploma. If you have a bachelor's degree, that figure rises to more than $1 million. Similarly, South Africa has the world's greatest return on investment for a university degree. Full stop, it's absolutely extraordinary. And yet, in both the United States and South Africa, half of all students enrolled in universities won't graduate, will accrue debt, and will end up with very little to show for their efforts. The reasons are manifold, and you've talked a lot about that over the last couple of days. Weak preparation, poverty, outdated institutional policies, and unfortunately, sometimes in different campus environments. But Kresge's experience in the United States suggested that it is possible to build, even if slowly, a better pathway. Hence, our conviction that the same could be done in South Africa and Sia Pumalela is the most tangible manifestation of that commitment. Among Sia Pumalela's most, no most noteworthy accomplishments include, one, the extensive cross-fertilization between South Africa and international leaders in student success, such as achieving the dream in Georgia State University. Two, the active participation of the South African Department of Higher Education and Training, University of South Africa, and the South African Council of Higher Education including the department beginning to fund Sia Pumalela inspired reforms on advising, on advising and data warehousing. Three, the participation of many non-grantee universities in Sia Pumalela, Puma, Sia Pumalela, Puma, this is what happens when you go 18 hours on an airplane, forgive me, on whatever this conference is called, um, convenings. <laughs> so sorry. Bill has tried to verse me in the different languages of South Africa, but it doesn't, doesn't work. But the participation of many of the non-grantee universities in trainings, convenings, and the evolving interventions and approaches. And for the increasing adoption of data analytics among grantees, laying the foundation for a robust spread of evidence-based decision-making on their own campuses and further afield. These are remarkable successes, including a number that we didn't anticipate. It is, however, critical and critically clear from the far-ranging and robust conversations you've had over the last two days that these successes are only the beginning. Sadie, working closely with grantees and multiple partners, has been working to design the next phase of student success efforts. They and we are focused on understanding how best to continue and expand the momentum and success that have made the universities of South Africa among the world's leaders in this work, and you are. It's a big challenge, but the outlines of possible responses are coming into clearer focus. First, we'll develop, in partnership with Achieving the Dream, a cohort of South African data coaches to strengthen local data coaching capacity. Second, We'll expand the network and the regional leadership nodes led by existing grantees, as well as create a new node in the Western Cape. Third, we'll create opportunities for less resourced institutions in the expanded network to learn more about equitable, evidence-based student success techniques 
And fourth, we'll develop specific cohort-based institutional success goals to help focus attention on the most effective approaches. This conference is profoundly impressive and inspiring in its assemblage of such high-quality scholarship, innovative thinking, strong institutional leadership, and robust collaborations. And not just because of what it portends for the future of student success, but also because of what it suggests for the South African orientation to the future. There is no question in my mind, none, that South Africa will be bold, will lead with intelligence and compassion, and will continue to show the world that deeply inclusive, just, and respectful change is not only possible, but is necessary for the future of our children and our children's children. We join with you in deep humility, given the extraordinary work and commitment you have all demonstrated. We're proud to be your partner. So thank you for listening at this late hour. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, allow me to thank uh, Rep Rapson for that inspiring and encouraging uh, presentation, and also for his, his long-term support for the higher education sector uh, in South Africa. I think he deserves another round of applause. <laughs> and now I'm going to ask Jenny to hand over a, a small gift <laughs> as indication of our appreciation.